Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are no addendum items this evening. However, we do have one registered delegate, that being Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dwar, concerning the installation of cast iron bollards along the Welland Canal. In addition, I have also been advised that there um, may be a desire to hear the report concerning the uh, management agreements um, with the um, uh, soccer club. Very the, smart clubs. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So that item may be, uh, it may be appropriate to consider that item first amongst items requiring separate consideration. Okay. Uh, is there, uh, I, this time I entertain a motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councillor Demery, seconded by Councillor Kenny. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Are there any disclosures of interest this evening? There being none, that shall be so noted. Um, we have a Five, we have a block of minutes here, and there are five items. I'll read them out, and uh, I would call for a motion to approve those if that is your wish. That's uh, the first one, a special meeting of Committee of the Whole, 02-17, held on February 1st, 2017. Next one, a special meeting of Committee of the Whole, 3-17, held on February 6th, 2017. Next one, a special meeting of the Committee of the Whole, 04-17, held on February 8, 2017. Next one, it's a special meeting of the Committee of the Whole, 06-17, held on February 16, 2017. And the final one is a regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole, 09-17, held on March 27, 2017. Uh, I entertain a motion for the adoption of those minutes, moved by Councillor Bodner, seconded by Councillor Elliott. All those in favor? Opposed? Those are carried. Move on to determination of items requiring separate discussion. On my left, any items of concern? Mr. Elliott? Uh, item four. On my right, Councillor Main. Four and eight. Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item seven, please. Are there any others? There being none. I'd like to call for a motion approving those items, not requiring separate discussion. Councillor Set, Gary By, second, Councillor Elliott. All those in favor? Carried. I should ask for a post. I think it was unanimous, though. So. It was carried. And unanimously. I would perhaps at this time ask if there is anyone from the soccer club who might like wish to speak to item number four. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So we'll deal with item number four first. 
Oh, Mr. Door, Jeff, would you please come forward? You are a delegate to make your presentation. We have roughly 10 minutes to do so. Hmm. Of your presentation, well, you do that. You're finished. Sure, of course. Right. Okay, marine bollards. What is a mooring bollard? A mooring bollard is used aboard a ship or barge to help moor a vessel, the anchoring point on the ship. Bollards are either made of cast iron or steel. The bollards in this presentation are all made of cast iron. They are very heavy, from the 1,200 pound to the 2,500 pound range. They need no maintenance to speak of. Why am I proposing the concept of a bollard park and information areas? I feel it would be interesting to walk from H.H. H. Noel Park following the canal both on the east side and the west side down to Derrick's Point Memorial Gardens and have resting areas, information areas. These areas would have a selected number of bollards, and behind or alongside would a description of the yard it came from and in, in general description of the vessel it came from. Why am I proposing? War metal and marine salvage started scrapping ships in Port Coburn in the early 1950s and continued doing so until the early 1990s. Many of our ships came from the United States and were built in various shipyards. These shipyards start in Chicago and weave their way through the Great Lakes up to Buffalo. Why am I proposing? At one time, some of the shipyards designed items like bollards and winches and have their names stamped into the castings. In amongst the many bollards that I have saved are approximately 30, 30 bollards, mostly double bit. The following shipyards have their names stamped on the top of a bit. Chicago, closed 1958. Manitowoc, closed 1968. Superior, closed 1936. Detroit, closed 1960. Cleveland, still open. Buffalo Dry Dock, closed in the early 60s. It's too bad I can't work this. Sizes, the small bollards are approximately 22 inches high up to 28 inches high. 10 larger bollards are up to 32 inches high. The remainder of the bollards, either cast iron or steel, have no, stamped, have na have no name stamped in the top signifying which shipyards or shipping company they came from. Their origins are only come from my memory. So those you have to rely on. Location. So I, I, I come up with this concept of taking four to six units and placing them in groups and going on to explore on an exploring walk from H.H. H. Noel Park to Derrick's Point. There would be a short description in plexiglass of the shipyards with stop off places, parkettes, on either side of the canal, old and new. This would be an attraction that no one else has to bring to tourists and boat nerds from all over the world, highlighting the history of the canal, the craftsmanship of lake shipbuilding and repair, while teaching Port Coburn and the canal's history in a friendly, interesting way, and explaining how some of the tools used on board the ships work. This is compensation. If you agree with the concept, I would require an assistant and in exchange of the goods, a piece of land, preferably with a barn or a little house, so I can live while I work in town organizing, etc. Unless you wish to purchase the bollards outright. It's your choice. Other items I want to speak about. The chain on the winches off the South American. I brought those up on purpose for the, from a ship that when the South American was being demolished down in Baltimore. And I've kept them in my yard. The winches that were built in Welland for the construction of the Welland Ship Canal, 
I have two winches that were built by H.H. Beatty, which I've kept, uh, which probably nobody in Welland really knows about either, but they are ones that came from, well, back in the 40s and 30s. They're steam winches, they're triple drum winches. Anchor chain that could be used in a sculpture contest. And the last one, the history of the Port Coburn Fairlead. What makes it so special worldwide? These are all additional photos, which if we could click this girl. Oh, look, will it go? Nope. Oh, there I go. Oh, goody. Thank you. Oh, well, hey, you just go away and I'll just... <laughs> These are ballers. These are double bit ballers. And as we have someone here that can click, We'll let them go. Now, these, as you can see from the name on the top, are from Detroit. If you can see at the very top, it's difficult to see some of these. Go to the next one, please. That, I cannot make out the name on it. So I have gotten six that I've talked about, which is a total of 30, and these other four, but I can't, I'll have to do some research to find out which one it is. I'm pretty sure that came from an eerie sand and gravel by the color. So I'll be able to figure it back. Uh, There's no name stamped in that. Uh, that looks like a Detroit. Uh, the far one you can see, which is Chicago. Well, I can see. Uh, that's it? That's all I showed you. There was ones there from Chicago, from Manitowoc, and superior. Those are very special to be in reality. Somehow they got lost in the shuffle. But the, um, those are really special because they have not. When I called up Manitowoc, I mentioned it to them and the girl said, you have one of those? I said, yes. When I spoke to the Smithsonian, she said, no. I said, yes, I have. One. I have one from superior. That's why it's so special and it will bring people from Manitowoc, from superior, from Chicago. The poor fellow in Chicago hasn't got any bollards. He asked me for two. He said, I don't care if it's got a name on it. I need some bollards. I said, OK. You have them here. Wittingly or unwittingly, we have a, a, a large number of very interesting things, which would, they're low maintenance, too, which would bring people here and they give them something to walk on. The concept is to go along both sides of the canal. To go from the canal, from HH down here, cross over, go up to Nickel, and up, up to Nickel Plant, to the beach up there, and weave around there, maybe go on some of the, the new lands you have, the Nickel Beach. It's up to you. And take it down the east to Lost View Park there, and over across the canal, and then I would like to sever, I don't know if the seaway will go long, but I'd like to sever part of that island. Leave the, some for storage and some for a parkland so they can look at the old canal and enjoy it and go behind that area, right by your little areas that you're building now, your, your new change halls and things, and look at the old canal and walk on that side of the island. And then take it out to Derrick's Point. I think it'd be fun, and it doesn't matter where it goes, that would be natural to everyone's decision, and you'd have a whack of things to do, to show people. Okay, there you go. thank now, you for your any questions? Yes, I will ask, does any member of council have a question, or questions? It's gotta be one. Ron? Councilor Bonder. Hi, Jeff, how are you? Good, Ron. <clears throat> It's an interesting concept, and I think um, a number of years ago, um, a number of us went to an FCM, a Federation of Canadian Municipalities conference in St. John's, Newfoundland. And um, when we had come back, what we had seen there was interpretive signage right on their harbor in the plexiglass, sure. you know, that actually explained what you were looking at. And we have that, and we talked about it, never really anything was done about it, but I think we have a great opportunity along the canal to do that, where you can see 
the old the old sections of the canal on West Street um, and other things that we could put on there. So, you know, they're not really attractive sitting there in your uh, yard as we look at those pictures, but, you know, you can envision what, uh, you know, whether they could be worked into some interpretive signage or something like that. So, you know, looks like they've been there for a couple of years. So, I would say you know, if you it takes us a couple of years to get to some decision on this, you know, don't be <laughs> surprised. But, you know, there is, it shouldn't just be dismissed offhand because there is an opportunity to, uh, to highlight areas of the canal and maybe, you know, one or two of these in the strategic locations, uh, Certainly wouldn't be out of line. So, thanks for bringing it forward. Thank you, Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Badner. Thank you, Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Dwart, Jeff. Thank you so much for for bringing this to us. I think it's a it's a wonderful concept. As a matter of fact, I was adding locations for you, but no. Nope. <laughs> in any case, I do think it's a wonderful concept, and I I really would like to see um, the city not miss this opportunity because I think it really can add a lot, uh, both in tourism and in just the appreciation for, for our heritage. I would like to see city staff work with possibly uh, the museum and Jeff and uh, get a, a few um, interested parties together and see what can come from this. No, it, yeah, it would be great. I would just love to see this. Yeah, I, I really don't want to see us miss this opportunity. You know, the thing I really want to do is help teach. I mean, here it is in my yard, doesn't do me any good. People don't know even in the United States what they had. We definitely don't know here. I was mentioning to the mayor the other day about the Port Coburn Fairly. I put it in at the end. I asked my son, who's an engineering student, oh, you know, son, tell me about the Port Coburn Fairly. He said, Dad, I don't know a thing about it. I was said, no. So then I went on with, I know, I can understand that you probably don't. Well, the fellas that, you, you have a fairly that was named after Port Coburn. It's known all over the world. Everyone that went through the seaway had to have the Port Coburn fairly. All these ships that are made still get made. At least the, the ones that are made for the Great Lakes, they all have that design fairly. I'm going to leave some information with you tonight it was designed by the McGee's. It was patented. It was built in 19... Hyten and McGee. Okay, the names that are the backbone of the community in many ways. And everyone had a roller fairly that went like this and two rollers that went like this so they could be angled as they went down in the locks so that the cables would stay in place. And once they designed it, everybody said, this is fantastic. Well, the reason I want to sh really sh highlight it is there was a second company, somewhat similar like these people that make these uh, beautiful bollards, and they stamped their name in it. The name is Oldman. It was like a, a, a company that they licensed it to. Well, everybody knows in the United States those as the Oldman Fairly. And if you look up in the history books about, about them, it shows the Oldman Fairly as the one that was the first. And somewhere, I think, somewhere Canadians have got to learn to sort of be a little more showy. So the Americans do it, and I think it should be something we should do just for our kids to say, you can do it. There's no reason why you can't invent. Anyways, I'll leave you the info. You can hopefully read it in your spare time. And uh, Mrs. I think Demery, do you have another question? Be good to chose. Uh, I would just like to to uh, make sure that we do have staff that are willing to work with Mr. Dwar and see what what can be accomplished. Uh, you may want to make a brief motion in that respect, but I I, I have a question. Though. It might be a Shoot. stumbling block. Uh, the compensation. What are you looking at financially? I have no to, idea. To, not I don't really want money. Money. Uh, what I really want is some place to stay and maybe it's like some place uh, one of your places you've had for taxes <laughs> that you don't need right now okay that I can go put a small place on so I can stay there when I come here in the summer because I don't plan on staying here all the time anymore I am trying to um, alleviate so I, but when I come back I'd like to have a place to go sleep and eat and then and it would be lovely if it had a barn because I'll, I can store stuff, because I know I always need to store stuff. That's why. 
nothing fancy at all. I, I, that's the last I want. And I do need assistance, someone who can use a computer because I'm illiterate. Okay, well, I think perhaps, uh, Madam Memory, if you wanted to perhaps move a motion on this uh, matter and we'll work it out with the staff and Mr. DeWar. Okay, um, then I would like to move that, um, or just give staff direction. The staff be directed to work with Mr. Dwar and um, just explore the opportunities and bring a report back to council. For final uh, that's all it would be, yes. Disposition. Yes. Is there a seconder for that motion? Councillor Bodner. Call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you, Mr. DeWar. It's a pleasure. I'll, I'll leave this with the gentleman here. It's the information on the... Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, the mayor's report to council. Uh, I'm going to bring to your idea the Special Olympics Ontario 2017 the Provincial School Championships are going to be sponsored here and by the Niagara Regional Police. The event is fast approaching and will require 300 volunteers on Monday, June 12th and Tuesday, June 13th. The Chief of Police has requested uh, uh, volunteers to step forward that will be required throughout the day at both sporting events and venues. <coughs> No experience is necessary. If you know of any of your friends and family that would like to participate, plus possibly yourselves, please uh, encourage them to visit the, white, the website for the school championships uh, of 2017. Easter Food Drive, the Fort Corporal Fire and Emergency Services, and Sobeys have teamed up on a food drive for Park Cares. It will be held this Saturday, April 15th, uh, in the Sobeys parking lot from 8 to 4. Uh, please uh, donate if you can and come out to this event. Support our firefighters and port cares. Easter extravaganza. Uh, the Easter egg hunt will also take place on this Saturday, starting at 10 a.m. And this year's venue has changed to the Valet Health and Wellness Center. We have teamed up with the YMCA this year to bring you crafts, free skating, and free swimming. Check out on our website uh, at porkopen.ca for exact times. That is the extent of my report. The regional counselor, I, I don't believe we have a report from him this evening. Are there any counselor's items, uh, issues, inquiries that the uh, members of the council would like to bring forward? Yes, Councillor Kenny. Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to uh, Mr. Hansen. Mr. Hansen, we've talked about this before, and you said that some work was going to be done, and that's on Kalali Street with the bridges there, and that big bump as we uh, cross over Mellonby. I guess it's Mellonby, and then it is getting worse. Getting worse. And now, of course, the beautiful weather. People have their best cars out now. And I've received several complaints uh, in regards to that. And they said it's nice that the sign's up letting you know that was a bump, but they already knew that was a bump. And the bump is getting worse. And I was wondering if you could give us some information as to um, any chance of getting that repaired soon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Kenny. We did report on this previously and had sent our concerns to the region some time ago, actually last fall, about the condition of the crossing. The response has been that the work will be done in May. Uh, it's because it's not simply a road repair, it's also a, a railway repair. So they have to do work, and they had to schedule the work. The nature of the bump is right at the railway crossing. Correct. The work has to be scheduled with the railway, so they have done that, and they're telling us that the timing on that is May. The response to uh, the concerns about the bump was to put the bump signs and the bump ahead signs up to warn people to slow down at the crossing. But unfortunately, that's not going to be until May because of the railway crossing issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Doucette, Councillor Danch, and Councillor Bodner on my list. Councillor Danch. I didn't see you. Thank you. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ron? 
we've talked about this I don't know how many times, but let's try it again. When will the work for Valet be scheduled? And the reason I'm asking that is that if you go down in that gym right now, there's eight, ten pails every time it rains. And I, and, and I mean, Mike has indicated to me what the possible fix is. we got to get it done. And it's not like the weather is not conducive, especially lately. Um, because every time I'm there, I mean, I get people complaining to me. I mean, I don't mind them complaining to me, but I wish I could tell them it'll be done in May or it'll be done in... Right now, all I can say is we're looking into it. And I've been saying that for two years now. Mr. Anderson. Here, Mr. Murdoch, Councillor Doucette. We agree with you 100%, Councillor Doucette. Uh, unfortunately, there's not an easy fix. If there was an easy fix, yeah. it would be fixed. Uh, we've taken three or four runs at this thing in terms of our uh, roofing consultant, the original general contractor. Uh, we've tried at least three different uh, repairs that have been put in on the gutter, which is the culprit on, on the main roof above the gym area. Uh, we've experienced a number of things, which is uh, flooding in the gutter itself, uh, evaporation on the pipes, which are below the roof of the, the arena that were leaking. Those have been repaired. There's still an open area that has to be repaired. Um, there's been many attempts uh, to get this thing resolved, and it's still obviously not resolved. You still see the buckets there. So as recently as about two or three weeks ago, we're in contact again with the general contractor. Uh, they're bringing in the roofing contractor who was involved in the original contract, who supplied all the steel in the roof, getting him back in to, to try to bring about the repairs that have been recommended by our roofing consultant. So the, you're, you're absolutely correct. The weather is conducive to getting this done now, and it has to get done. Uh, this will be the third or fourth attempt to get the roof fixed, and it still hasn't been successful. So other areas are opening up within the same area of the gutter that haven't been resolved. So we're working away at it. Uh, I know it's it's frustrating to see it, and it's frustrating for everybody that uses the facility to see this. It's sort of the worst case scenario when you have a, a brand new facility, multi-million dollar facility, and then have this roof leak for four years. It's been four years now since it was built. So uh, it's no excuse. We're not making excuses for it. We're just trying to get a resolve uh, short of legal actions short of the city going in and trying to facilitate or repair ourselves and maybe negating any type of uh, warranty work that could be done by this contractor we have to be very careful on the next step if we choose to go that way uh, we're going to go down a path that perhaps will get the roof sealed but bring about other issues so um, just trying to resolve it in this way and going through the proper construction contract process to get it and hopefully we can get it this spring. Any other questions on that specific Sorry, issue? No, no. Ron, is there a drop dead day that we would not go beyond? I appreciate your concerns about invalidating any guarantees, but we've been discussing this issue practically for the term of this council. Yes. Um, is there a point of no return? Mr. Mayor, there's a 20-year there's a warranty on the roof. So, we're, again, four years in, we're trying to work with the contractor to ensure that the warranty work stays in place. Our real concern without really getting the legalities of it is to go in and facilitate a repair on our own that would perhaps be successful or not successful, and then negating warranty set are on the building themselves. So again, just trying to work with the contractor and get this done. Uh, if we had an easy solution, as I said to Councillor Doucette, we would certainly just go in and implement it and get it done. But it's not, it's not simple. There's a, a number of factors that are uh, the result are the cause of the water in the building that have to be addressed. And we're trying to do that. It's a very large roof and a very complex drainage system on the roof itself. I, I appreciate, what, appreciate what you're saying, but I think we're getting to the point to, uh, that Council's patience is wearing thin. And uh, we don't want litigation, that's for sure, but that's what it takes. That's what we're going to have to do. I think, Mr. Mayor, just to respond to that particular point, um, 
if council directs that we take that route and we certainly advise council on on next steps if we are unsuccessful at the, at the next step in in getting the roof repaired i think maybe we want to go back to council and maybe in camera and, and discuss legal implications of of going to the next step on it and advise council of their options at that point in time i don't disagree though it's just far too long to, I like that idea. Thank you. to do that Councilor Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Hansen. Um, I think we've all seen emails. I think you were copied on it too. On um, a concern on snow fences uh, that are being put on farmland, and um, one of the things is what happens if there if damage occurs. Can can you give us uh, the policies that the city has and our ability to do that and um, and do we have any policy if uh, if damage occurs? Here, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Bodner. Um, I'll start by saying that it's absolutely mandatory that we put snow fences out in the rural area on open sections of roadway for public safety and for our snow plowing operations themselves. Because of the wind conditions we have here, the, the drifting of the snow, it's extremely dangerous and extremely time consuming in keeping these open roads clear. So we haven't had, to the best of my knowledge, we haven't had any claims of compensation for crop damage that I'm aware of. We did have an issue uh, last fall for the first time uh, asking us not to put snow fence on a, on a number of um, uh, farm fields. So working through our solicitor, we had a, a letter prepared, a sort of a template letter that we have available and, and going forward will be our policy and our procedure in going forward with it. If I can just read a couple of the paragraphs out of this uh, letter that was prepared by our solicitor and it invokes the um, clause in the Municipal Act that gives municipalities authority to put farm fence, or sorry, snow fence on farm fields uh, for public safety. So under the authority of Section 60 of the Municipal Act, a municipality may at any reasonable time enter upon the land within the municipality lying along a highway under its jurisdiction for the purpose of erecting and maintaining a snow fence. The legislation is in place to address problems with blowing and drifting snow during a typical winter season. As you can appreciate, snow-covered roads caused by drifting can result in hazardous driving conditions. The erection of snow fences in certain locations within the municipality is part of the city's winter maintenance operations. The city will continue this practice this year under its authority set out in the Municipal Act. The purpose of this correspondence is to advise you as a property owner that the municipality will be installing snow fencing along the highway abutting your property located at a certain address during the following period of time. We appreciate your continued cooperation. If you have any questions, we give them our public works number to contact. So the intent of this letter is really to tell them, give them the reasons why we want to put snow fence up and the legislative authority to do it. Even the province of Ontario understands the, the public safety impact of, of having a snow fence in place and give us this uh, authority. So we did invoke this with one a property owner who had, who had um, complained about putting the snow fence up and a potential crop damage. So we delivered this letter uh, to him and took the time to explain to him exactly what we were doing and, and what the intent was, and that was last fall. We haven't heard anything back in terms of crop damage. And as I said, I, I'm not aware of crop damage occurring in the past. So in going to the, the email, the letter from the association, uh, they had asked that we that the city take as much care as is necessary in the erection and removal of snow fencing to eliminate or minimize soil and crop damage. We certainly do that. Uh, we won't put equipment on a wet farm field that will do damage to the field. We'll send the people in and do it manually if necessary, and we're doing that right now. Uh, the concern about post wires and ties would never be left on the field as they might damage uh, either crops, animals, or, or the equipment itself. So we're very cognizant of these concerns, and we, we follow this policy as we go forward and put the snow fence up. Uh, we don't have a policy in place in terms of claims because I don't believe we've had claims of crop damage in the past. So I think in answer to that question, if somebody had a, a claim, uh, they could certainly come forward and, and we would deal with the claims on a case-by-case -case basis as it came forward. 
Um, I think that's it in terms of um, our policy and procedures. I guess I could take any other questions you might have on that. So just to follow up, just because we have the authority to go on there, uh, we're extra careful realizing that, you know, that's the farmer's livelihood and, and we don't want to impact anything, you know, that will uh, will be detrimental to them. So um, you're confident that our staff uh, knows the value of that uh, crop that's on there and we do minimum damage, if any, um, just to get that fence up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Bader. Yes, we, we've reinforced this with public works staff. We've had these discussions and I know I'm very confident that uh, they're well aware of the issue involved and, and very careful in, in putting up and taking down the fences. Thank you. Councilor Rutgers on this issue. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. To, through you to Ron Hanson. So, um, so if a landowner did believe that they did suffer some damages, how would that landowner proceed? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Butters. I, I think the best thing to do would be to uh, submit a claim as we would on any other damage type situation. Submit a claim. We'll certainly investigate immediately and deal through our broker and insurance adjusters. Thank you very much. Councillor Danch. Yeah, on this issue. Oh, on this issue? Go ahead, Councillor Elliott. On this issue. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to Ron. Does the, <clears throat> excuse me. Does the legislation talk about any damages incurred um, on entering the land to put the fence up? Do they remove any responsibility from us in minor damage uh, by going on other people's property? Is that mentioned at all? Through you, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Elliott. I don't believe so. I believe the onus is on the municipality. If we were to go on there, obviously, with heavy equipment or something, damage the fields, we would certainly be liable or, or uh, be responsible for that damage. Okay. So in, in response to that, then, do we ever photograph before and after pictures prior to us going on the land and then after installation of the fence for protection from us? Because if nobody knows what the land looked like before we started and then a claim comes in and says, you did this damage, how do we know it's he said, she said, he said, he said, um, and with no evidence to show that we were on installed the fence and left the property as it was on both ends in the fall when we we're erecting it and then in the spring when we we're taking it down? Um, it would be good to have some evidence that we left it the way that it should be. Here, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Elliott, I think that's a good suggestion. I, I don't believe we're doing that at the present time. I would assume that if there were crop damage, rutting in the fields or whatever, it would be fairly obvious along the line of the snow fence and, and we would have to take responsibility for that. But I like your idea of, uh, as we would on other instances with sidewalks and other types of claims, we'd certainly use photography as a, as a protection uh, against liability and I like that suggestion. So certainly there's nothing to prevent us from putting that into our policy uh, to do that in the future. Good. Any other questions on this issue, Councillor Maine? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Ron. Just a thought, Ron. How many kilometers of snow fence is the city responsible for, the region responsible for, and the MTO? Because I know we got three groups putting snow fence up. Would would ours be a heck of a lot smaller than the region and, and the MTO? Would it not? As far as how much snow fence we put up? Through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Maine. I'm not certain of the total length, but you raise a good point about jurisdiction. We we have no control, for instance, on Wilhelm Road, on Miller Road, and Schill, which are are the only regional roads that would be impacted. We'd have no control on, on the operation of that and, and potential um, crop damage or field damage in those cases. MTO does put a lot of snow fence up along Highway 358 and 140. Uh, there's some, not a lot. Uh, so it's a good point. It's a jurisdictional thing. Uh, it may end up being, I would suggest we have probably quite a bit more than the uh, region has with only those three roads. I'm not certain about MTO. Um, so uh, we've talked to the foreman about that as well in terms of uh, jurisdiction and, and they were of the opinion that they weren't really certain if there had been any claims or that type of damage from any of the other agencies or jurisdictions. So. 
Um, it's just something we don't have any control over. It's separate, separate operation. Thank you. Are you finished, Councilor Mate? Yes, sir. Okay, Councilor Bonner. I just wonder, um, you say, uh, Mr. Hansen, that we have had no claims whatsoever. Would it make some sense to contact the MTO in the region just to see whether they have some kind of a formula for that? So if we ever did run into that, we'd be in sync with what everybody else is doing? Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilor Bodner. I know, I know we've been in contact with the region in terms of uh, how they also invoke Section 60 of the Municipal Act. Uh, I'm not sure about MTO. I would suggest it's probably different legislation. So we can certainly do that, make those contacts, and see if there's any instances of a claim. Finish, Councilor Bodner. Yes, thank you. Councilor Dench on this issue or another issue? Yeah, I'll get my two cents in here, too, okay. I guess. <clears throat> I'll go for a nickel. I mean, I mean, uh, I can see the farmer's point, of course, but there's also these things that drive around in the winter called uh, four-wheelers and snowmobiles and stuff like that. I mean, golf courses have issues with, you know, all-terrain vehicles and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know, we kind of squawking here over a little bit of winter wheat or something like that. I'm sure the guys are very careful as what they do and so let's not be just picking on the city staff. There's guys out there that are uncontrollable that are just going all over the place. So my two cents. Any comment, Mr. Anton? No, Mr. Ryan. That's good. Good point. Now, are there any more discussions on this issue? There being none, uh, Mr. Dance, you have an issue? Sure. I got another nickel's worth here. Uh, through you to Mr. Hansen, uh, I was approached by uh, Dewa Carter School, and uh, they're having their yearly fun night on uh, May the 25th, and they've asked me if I would pick up some picnic tables, and I told them, of course, I would do this for free, because that's what I seem to do. Uh, like, this time, I'd like to get permission uh, from the park staff to get about 12 picnic tables on that date, if I could. Mr. Hanson, to Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Danch, as, as Council knows, it's against city policy to uh, loan out uh, picnic tables to anything other than a regionally significant event or a city-sponsored event. So, as happened last year, uh, we we can't lend the picnic tables out unless Council directs us to. So, if Council chooses to waive the current policy, uh, that's their prerogative. Mr. Danch. Uh would a motion be appropriate at this time? I'd, I'd like to make a motion, if I could, to uh, borrow those picnic tables for Diva Carter School, please. A little more particulars, how many for how long? Well, we're going to take 12. That's what uh, they're planning for, but, uh, you know, if we could plan for 12, it would be appreciated. Okay. 10. Councilor Eight. I'll second Eight. that. Second it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said how many. May the 25th. And could we have the leave of council to entertain that amendment? Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Demery. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Now on the actual motion, could we have a vote? All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Carried. I finished, Mr. Dench. Mrs. Butters, uh, do you have a separate item that you wish to discuss? My turn? It's your turn, okay. if you wish okay. to take it. Yes, please. Uh, a couple things, Mr. Mayor, on, um, oh, let's see, where to begin? April 15th, the Shirkston Community Center will have their Easter egg hunt at 10 o'clock. So um, if you're out in Ward 4 and you want to come to that one, come along. If not, go to the Vale. Center um, on April 22nd at 10 a.m. at the Shirkson Community Center. There is going to be a um, hopefully a good turnout of people that are interested in becoming a volunteer firefighter from that area. So uh, those folks who have that interest, Shirkson Community Center, April 22nd at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, let's see. My next one is, uh, I guess, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Hansen. Uh, there's a little piece of Snyder Road that runs off of Kalali Street East 
going north. It's a clay road. And um, just a ways in off the road, I noticed it looks like somebody's used it for a dump. There's a, I don't, I didn't drive down there to see what's down there, but it looks like somebody's dropped, dropped off stuff that needs to be taken away. Uh, the other thing is, um, you will remember during our budget deliberations um, that $20,000 was allotted for the Pleasant Beach, um, to help clean up the Pleasant Beach garbage situation. And so we met last, was it Wednesday? Wednesday. Last Wednesday, um, we've tweaked that plan uh, once again. And uh, we just want to make, I think you all got an email on it, but we want to make sure that it's still okay for us to proceed along the lines that, that now I think we're all got consensus on and that council's fully aware and, and understanding where we're going with that. I think the um, what the committee's come up with, they feel comfortable and that it's going to be workable. And a fenced air in area compound hopefully will happen um, on the lodge property and everything will happen at that place. It will be well screened and well hidden. And um, that's what we're hoping to proceed with, with a public meeting at, at uh, down at Shirkson Community Center sometime early May, May 6th. May 6 for that community. So if anybody has any questions on on that, now's the time. Otherwise, we're going to be going full steam ahead, I hope, and resolve the issues there. Well, would uh, a report be prepared to, to come back to Council to uh, approve all of the things that you're talking about, but not giving us specifics on? Um, Mr. Hanson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just, just to answer that, uh, we're meeting tomorrow with the region, the region's contractor, and the Pleasant Beach Association tomorrow morning at the enclosure, or at the compound, to sort out what this enclosure might look like, how it's going to be screened, and so on. We were hoping that with the allocation that was made by Council of Budget uh, in discussions with the committee and, and the two ward councillors, that as long as the um, enclosure's expenditure is, is for the same purpose, it's not going to be on the road in two locations, it's going to be on the lodge property in one location. So the intent of the budget allocation is the same, to enclose the garbage and to screen it. So uh, if council directs, we will certainly bring another report forward. If not, the, the intent is the same. We can give a, a further update, I think, after the May the 6th uh, public meeting even at, until May 6th, we won't know if we actually have a plan. If it's totally rejected by the residents there, then we're back to square one again, I guess. So um, we can do an update, I think, after the May 6th meeting, if council would like to see that. I think it would be appropriate to, uh, there's so much division within the folks that live out there that uh, we wouldn't want to leave ourselves wide open to be spending the money uh, which really wasn't authorized. Uh, to any great extent. So, uh, what are your wishes, Council? Do you wish to, Mr. Bonner? I think, I think that's not unreasonable, but I think what, what we're really looking for is to be able to move ahead at, with some assurance while we have all the people at that meeting that if the consensus is that that property is the best spot to put in it, and it looks like it is. I think we all thought that early on, um, is that we we don't want to have to come back and, um, you know, and say, well, that probably will work, but we got to go back and do it. Um, the money's going to be spent in some location. I think the committee's just asking, can we go ahead and just say if everybody's in agreement with con with some confidence that council will back us that we'll be able to say yeah that's that's the spot we want it um you know like the other uh, factor time is of the essence because of the, the cottage period well now we don't want to miss this season again i think we <laughs> we've been through a lot of years of of misery out there for the people that live there so i think um it's getting late enough now, so as soon as we get into May, people will be there and we'll be into that same mess. So I don't know how uh, how we should do this, but I think 
unless Mr. Hansen or Council Butters has another idea, we just, I think they want to be able to just say, let's put this to bed if everybody's in agreement or the majority is in agreement. Really, is what it is. Mr. Mayor, I think we can say with some confidence that the, the expenditure is going to be reduced with the one location as opposed to three. So I think the, the construction of the enclosures and preparation of the areas is going to be reduced. The money's budgeted at $20,000. We would not overspend that by any amount. Uh, there's a good opportunity now maybe to reduce that amount and, and come back to Council with the final results and so on. But Councilor's Bo uh, Councilor Bodner's point is well taken. We want to really go in on May 6th to the public meeting with a lot of confidence that that's a go-ahead. The city's commitment is the $20,000 maximum, and that's a go for it. So I, I think that's important. Subject to any concern being voiced by Council at this time, uh, we will let the... Uh, the committee attempt to get a consensus from the uh, cottagers. Ms. Mayor, Agreed. can I continue? Oh, certainly, Ms. Thank Butters. you. Okay, this one is also through you to Mr. Hansen. I had a, got a question from a resident today who was reading in the newspaper about the tender that's going out, replacement of water mains and whatnot, and she wondered if when we do work like that and we're tearing up roads and stuff do we coordinate with the other utility companies so that kind of work happens in sync with them if if there is work to be done with other utilities through you mr mayor council voters yes absolutely that's a must that all the coordination sometimes it's a year ahead of time if we're in for instance the nickel area and we're going through that storm sewer program we've been talking to the utility companies since mid last year as part of the design we know we have bell relocations, uh, gas main relocations within the, the work area, so certainly that's always a coordination issue. We only, only want to dig up the road once. We don't want to come back in after it's reinstated, so that's a matter, of course, I'll let her in know. doing the work. And my last question, I think this goes to Mr. Aquilina, um, between emails, phone calls, and to some degree Facebook kind of blowing up, uh, there's been uh, uh, people noticed out on the 140 out Ramey Road area that there was little buildings going up and there was fences going around those buildings and and then um, dogs appeared on the property and and uh, people got real have been real riled up. So could you give us an update or put the public's mind at ease on on kennel licensing and maybe how that works and how it pertains to this particular area. Um, a lot of, I mean, I'm glad people are concerned, I mean, aware of the fact that puppy mills are terrible, but the bottom line is there's no evidence to that effect here. And I think we need to just make it really clear that things are on the up and up, which I, I think you can help us do that. Mr. Aquiline. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Butters. Our zoning bylaw dictates the use of kennels. We actually define what a kennel is. There are certain provisions in the bylaw that you have to have a certain size property, have to have proper setbacks. There's a lot of th provisions that regulate that. Once the zoning is in place, one must actually apply through the licensing clerk to get a kennel license. Part of that kennel license is a circulation to the different staff and agencies, one being the Humane Society, they inspect, it goes to building, it goes to bylaw, it goes to planning, and it may go to other individual staff. So there is an application through corporate services for a kennel license. It has been inspected. We are still awaiting an inspection by the Humane Society. There is a complaint on the property, but I can tell council that the zoning complies and the license has not yet been issued by the clerk's office. Go ahead, Ms. Vaughn. And, and just to follow up that, a lady asked me a really interesting question. Now, for a kennel license, that's for um, purebred dogs, is that correct? Or can anybody get a kennel license? Mr. Ackland? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'm going to defer that to the clerk's office to comment. I, my department doesn't actually deal with the license, so. Okay. Madam Clerk? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, it's for purebred dogs. Okay, so to follow up on that question um, is, what if a person has purebred pugs and they also have purebred beagles 
and and there's a lot of this that happens in they call them designer dogs and they breed a, a beagle to a pug and that equals a bug hmm. or a puggle one or the other so does that void the kennel license because at that point you're breeding mutts Clark? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the bylaw stipulates that any deviation from the uh, provisions, meaning if they are not purebred dogs, that application would then need to come forward to council for approval. So. Thank you very much. Um, don't worry, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, and it's on the same issue. Uh, I just wanted to uh, understand the difference between the breeding kennel and the boarding kennel and uh, to know what the licensing arrangements for those would be. Are, can we ask for a boarding kennel? or must that also be a breeding kennel? Can they be separate? Madam Clerk. Through you, Mr. Mayor, up until this point in time, all of the kennel licenses that we have, apart from compassionate reasons, are for um, uh, breeding purposes only. We haven't had a, a boarding kennel um, to date. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Bonner. Through you to Councilor Butters, I want to see a picture of that dog. Dog and I just can't. Anyways, just in a second. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, uh, are there any responses from staff to previous areas of concern expressed at previous previous meetings? Yes, Mr. Sass. Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to um, just advise Council that. Um, I think the through your office, we're going to be looking for um, a couple dates um, coming forward uh, with regard to the water budget. Um, looking at April 25th, uh, possibly being the uh, uh, the night for uh, to deal with the water budget itself, and also looking at uh, potentially May 1st to deal with the downtown CIP and uh, providing a meeting um, with staff, council, and the. Um, uh, the downtown uh, BIA to discuss um, the CIP and where where council uh, sees the um, the project going forward. So uh, those those two dates will be uh, will be coming forward. And I believe that uh, the, uh, through the mayor's office uh, that was going to go up to council to uh, to make sure that everybody's available for those dates. Would those dates uh, also would the public be able to attend those meetings? Yes, Mr. Mayor, there are public meetings. Thank you. So, Council, if you could uh, contact my office as to whether those dates work for you. Thank you. Any other items uh, from members of staff? There being none, uh, we go on to consider consideration of items requiring separate discussion. The first one was item number four, and it was uh, recommended by Mr. Elliott, but are, Madam Clerk, are we going to separate these uh, into uh, one uh, item with respect to the soccer club would be deferred and the other two items uh, uh, would likely proceed? Is that your understanding? Councilor Elliott, do you wish to speak to that division? Yes, yeah, first I'll put the uh, item on the floor. Community Corporate Services, Community Service Division Report Number 2017-46, Management Lease Agreement Renewals for the Summer Minor Sports Associations. Is there a seconder? What well, are you actually, we have three agreements that are being considered. Correct. And are you? Well, I'd like to get the item introduced first and then we can speak to what we want to do. Okay, seconder for that item, Councilor do that. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Um, and eventually, I would like to split them out, but I'm, that I will not use the deferral word right now because I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to it. So instead of putting forward that right now, we'll wait and see if, if any other counselors want to speak to it. Um, just, uh, we've all got the, uh, the email um, from the president of the, uh, the soccer club and um, looking to uh, have a chance to speak to staff about the uh, the agreement um, just a couple of questions I had um, Peter and I'll and I'll through you mr. mayor to uh, the treasurer in your email that you sent out um, and this may have a little bit to do with with the agreement as well um, this the the soccer club committed to donating 
um, X number of dollars, $150,000 to the city of Port Coburn for soccer fields and things like that. Um, so far, that started in 2005. Um, they had pledged a 10,000 year for 15 years to get us to 2020, which is actually the expiry date of the agreement that we're going into right now. Um, so far, I believe that you had said in the 10 years or 12 years since um, the agreement was reached, they have pledged $80,000 to us, which leaves 70000 for the next five years. Um, is there a condition on that being a drop that date for 2020 to have all the, the money donated? Because I'm not sure in the first 12 years, 50% of the money was donated. And I'm not sure if anybody's from the soccer club here, I'm not concerned about the money. I just want to know whether there's a condition on it that it has to be donated by 2020. Because if 50% has been donated in the first 12 years, they got 50% to go in the next three. So mm -hmm. I'm just cautioning about that, whether that is a drop dead date. Three, Mr. Mayor, it, it's, it's not a drop dead date, but um, the agreement basically was uh, $10,000 a year. And uh, for the most part, that has been that has been um, acknowledged each year where we're, we're receiving uh, the $10,000 a year. The agreement was um, uh, originally done back in uh, 2005, I believe. Yeah. Um, and then it was um, sort of renewed again um, just a couple years, a couple years ago. And um, that would continue until the point in time when the, uh, the $150,000 commitment is uh, provided by the, uh, the soccer club. But they've been uh, very diligent in providing the $10,000 on, on the annual uh, basis. Okay, thanks. I, I just didn't, I didn't want to see anything come between their yeah, use of no. our fields and anything on the financial side. And I guess, you, you know, this has been renewed all the time and it's just been one of those things that has been turned over and over and over and it's, you know, signed off and the devil's in the details. Is this agreement pretty much um, the same agreement that most user groups have? I'm, I'm just looking at, I guess when you get into the details of it, um, some of the things that you look at, you kind of wonder, you know, with the maintenance and, and things like that, which seem to be capital improvements and, and, and capital portions that seem to be owned by us, purchased by and maintained by the soccer club. And I'm just trying to get my head around all of that. Is it a standard lease agreement that we've entered into here? Um, or is this something that we've kind of developed in partnership with the, uh, with the soccer club? Three, Mr. Mayor. This uh, agreement was developed at the onset when the uh, soccer fields were um, reconstructed uh, back in the day, and uh, where it was a maintenance, a management agreement, where the soccer club basically was uh, um, in charge of the of the the washer facility, their canteen area, and so on, and also the soccer field. So it's been an ongoing agreement uh, between the soccer club and uh, and the city. There have been some uh, times where, you know, whether, you know, who's cutting the grass, painting lines, and so on and so forth. So it is very specific due to the fact that it is um, um, an agreement with a uh, soccer club that has, um, we have equipment, they have equipment, we have the facility which was built when we, when we purchased, when we um, did the reconstruction of the soccer fields and so on, and the lights. And so there are capital components that we know. Um, um, our city uh, that we would be responsible for, uh, but for the most part, uh, so a lot of the maintenance stuff of the the, the things that sort of um, uh, nets and that type of stuff is uh, more so uh, where the soccer club for their for their use. Uh, they're in charge of uh, the uh, facility itself, cleaning the washrooms. Uh, um, stocking the washrooms and, and so on. Uh, we do have other groups that do come in. We have tournaments and so on. And um, in the agreement it is that um, if, if that's the case, then we make sure that the groups are supposed to um, uh, keep them clean. And we would also restock the, um, the uh, facility if, if need be. Uh, so there's a number of different things in the agreement. Um, with the, the letter that we did receive, um, just late last night or this morning, um, where we've, we, we were dealing with, uh, or um, our staff was dealing with uh, the soccer club on the agreement. We thought it was all, all put together because we received an email, said it, was, it, it looked good and so on. Uh, so 
the couple of the issues that uh, Brown brought forward, I think there's there are things that we can sit down with uh, the soccer club that should be an issue with regard to uh, working on some of those details, and then we'll just bring the agreement back to uh, to council at that time. Okay. Thank you. And that's all the questions I have, and I would reserve a motion until such time while we can see if any other councillors want to speak to it before we do anything with the uh, with the item in, all, in total. Any other speakers on this issue? We appear there is none. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Then through you, I would like to uh, do it as a motion to yeah uh, request to separate it and uh, approve um, the agreements with um, with minor baseball and the minor girls softball association, and then we'll defer the. Um, defer the agreement with the uh, Sir John Colburn Youth Soccer Club until such time as a meeting can be arranged between uh, the Board of Directors of the Soccer Club and, and City staff. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Okay. All right. Is there a seconder for the, the overall recommendation? <laughs> Councillor Dwyer's? All right. Now, we would like a vote on each of the three clubs separately. Okay. No. Is this the first one being deferred? Well, is that what you said? Did you say deferred? Five? Yeah, defer, defer, the, defer the one, with, defer the agreement with the uh, soccer, first. with the soccer club? There'll be three separate votes, though. If, no, I, I would I would take it as one vote. We're just going to defer the okay. soccer Everyone club agreement and then accept. Separate. Yeah, and then under Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next item. I believe it's item number seven. It's Alderman Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Engineering and Operations, Operations Division, report number 2017-48, subject renewable passive energy generation for the Port Colburn Operations Center. Is there a seconder for that recommendation? Also do set. Discussion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was very encouraged to see this come forward. I know that uh, Councillor Desset has been working on this for a long time, so it was uh, good to see this this come to us. I would like to um, have Darlene Saturday, who's here in in, uh, uh, in the galley, come uh, come and speak to everyone about what this will mean for Port Colborne and what advantages we can see for this. Mrs. Sutter, put the microphone on, please. Thank you. There you are. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Damery. Um, this was a motion to Council that she wanted us to investigate uh, what we could do with the passive energy at the facility. It is a very green facility. It's uh, high-tech LED lights, lots of natural lighting. I know you've all toured the facility. Uh, but of course, we do have an energy conservation demand management plan for the city. And we did commit in that plan, or Council committed in that plan, that we would um, investigate alternative en energy sources to reduce our consumption and our greenhouse gas emissions. So we, I looked at three different options that uh, are currently out there, basically uh, taking ourselves off the grid, um, or just, sorry, sorry, not take ourselves off the grid, just reduce energy costs uh, by putting maybe solar panels up or investigating a passive source, um, looking at the feed-in tariff or the microfit program, uh, which the province is doing right now, and uh, another option called net metering. And in investigating the three different options, um, the net metering came up to be the best option. So basically net metering in, I spoke with a gentleman who's currently doing this in Niagara on the Lake. He's getting them in the midst of uh, installing them at his facility. It would take the benefits of reducing our own electricity costs, so generating our own electricity for the facility, and give us the added benefit of if we were using less than we generated, uh, it would essentially run the meter backwards. So, and we would get a credit. So basically, if we, whatever kilowatt hour we send back into the system, we get a credit on our bill. So not only would we um, 
be able to reduce our energy costs by generating a percentage of it. We would also uh, be able to reap the benefits, say on the weekend when the facility is not as much in use. We're using, we're generating more than we're using, and we could get uh, get get our meter to run backwards. So. The feed-in tariff program, or the FIT program is out there. Its, it's micro-FIT program is going to be replaced probably by this net metering program. And um, this, is, this is just a responsible decision. It reduces our electricity and, uh, and uh, gives us an opportunity to save some energy costs. So that's, that's what we're recommending. Thank you, Mrs. So, Sutter. Thank you. Questions on Mrs. Butters? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to, to Darlene. So is it, is it possible to apply this to more than one city facility and to set this up on more than one and where i'm thinking is is the bail center which we have like big 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 cost for electricity and electricity is so expensive so is that possible um through you mr mayor it, it honestly that's something we could perhaps investigate um i know that there are some building uh building concerns like building permit issues and structural issues but that's definitely something we could perhaps investigate that might be something um because the gentleman i spoke with said you know get yourself a year of operating under your belt because you don't want to size the system that it's going to um generate all your electricity because then you're not reaping the benefits of being able to run your meter backwards uh so perhaps at that time if you know if we, we could perhaps look into the cost of what it would cost to evaluate it so yeah, potentially okay. Okay. Set. thank you very much mr mayor um darlene this is excellent uh i was hoping it was going to come back as net metering because in my own investigations net metering seems to be the best way to go um it we need to make sure that we have the right size though to be able to benefit the the most from net metering so we will need a year and and i gather your recommendation is that we apply and request some money from 2018 to be able to do this study so that we can size it properly and that works out perfect but if we wind up doing this that means that at least we'll have experience with one facility going back to councillor uh, butter's option my only concern is structurally one of the things that when we started building valet that i requested is to make sure that it was going to be structured so that we could eventually do that well we didn't do that bottom line is it's not built and won't be able to handle the weight that this will add believe it or not it was not okay and that was one of the reasons why i insisted as much as i did on the up center that it be built structurally so that we could do something like this on the roof because i'll tell you right now if we try to do it at valet we've got to add structure it's going to add a lot of cost to be able to do it so maybe another option for them may not be solar panels on the roof it may be solar panels somewhere else or whatever whatever reason but i'll tell you right now valet is not structured to be able to handle the weight of this okay i've been told that over and over again and i was sure we had insisted that it was and i'm looking at your face right now <laughs> you thought it was as well so so it, it, i'm telling you right now it's not okay and that's a major issue okay it saved money at the time but now it's going to cost us money if we want to do something like this. But Darlene, this is an excellent report. I support this. I think it's time that we do something like this. And we consider it in other buildings as we go along. Once we have the experience of this building, we can expand it. And there's nothing that says we can't expand it somewhere else. Even at Valet, if we can't put it on the roof, we might be able to put it somewhere else. But somehow, we should be able to do something for all our, all our buildings. And that would make us um, probably the envy of a lot of other areas if we can start doing this uh, with our buildings. And that's what's important here. We're doing it with our buildings and we're saving the citizens money by doing this in the long run. Because if you look carefully at what she's talking about here, I believe payback is anywhere from six to seven years and after that, you've paid your system off. And whatever hydro you produce is yours, period. 
Okay, and and, and uh, I believe the most of these most of these panels are warranted for 25 years. So you figure out the benefits. I believe it's 25 years, but I, uh, uh, Darlene can. I'm sure Darlene has checked that out. But um, this says uh, a lifespan of 20. But I've I've been able to get 25 years out of some of my investigations. So even if it's 20 years, you're talking 13 years of free hydro. That's what you're talking about. That's a hell of a benefit. So thank, thank you very much for the, the for the report, Darlene. Yeah, to follow up on um, Councillor Doucette, maybe through you to Mr. Louie, um, if monies are required to to you know investigate these things. Do you think that it would be worth it to um, check and see if there's any federal or provincial programs that would be helpful to us in this endeavor? Mr. Lloyd. Sure, through your worship to Councillor Butters, I have been, uh, well, all staff have been closely watching the announcements from the federal government since being sworn in a little bit over a year and a half ago, as well as provincial funding. Some of the funding that's come out federally has been very, very focused on uh, transit, um, on some uh, on some rural and northern development, uh, you know, projects, and of course, Port Coburn has a rural component and is in statistically is a rural municipality, uh, even though it's an urban area, and focused on green infrastructure. And so, I think this might qualify under the green infrastructure area. I do have uh, I do have uh, I have communicated with our MP Vance Badaway about meeting in person on May 5th. It's not booked yet, but it's planned for May 5th. Uh, I can probably bring that up at that time with our MP and see if there's any federal programs that we would qualify for. Um, provincially, I'm not sure of anything right at the moment, so I'll probably take it back with staff tomorrow and do a little bit of research and see if there's a provincial program. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to uh, Darlene, you did say that we need to get the building up and running for a year before um, we decide, you know, what size of the system. So you're going to go through four seasons. So basically, we've got a year to investigate everything, um, and we really don't need to get any consultant on board until such time as we've got some facts and figures on what costing is. Um, so we can let this run into next year. And, and I'm assuming you're talking a four full season study to make sure that. We get a true cost of of whatever of what our, our cost is of, of hydro or electricity for the building. Yeah, uh, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, basically, we'd want to get a year of this this facility to kind of see what our baseline consumption is going to be, and that way that will allow the um, if we do have a, a consultant come in and do a feasibility, they can recommend the sizing because the gentleman I spoke with who's who's doing this right now said it's very important not to oversize it because if we oversize it, um, it basically we wouldn't reap the benefits of having the meter run backwards. We would definitely offset our own consumption, but we wouldn't receive the credits. And he said that's he says you want to squeeze as many credits out as you can <laughs> so he, that's how he put it to me um, he says you really have to, to optimize it so until we get an idea of what the facility is going to take to run and, and you know when our peak periods are on that um, we'll be able to get all the information for our energy provider because uh, they they have the meters and they they have data loggers in them and things like that so yeah a good, a good years of, of information will definitely be beneficial okay and just one one quick follow-up question and I'll three mr. mayor to uh, mr. Hansen when we start to move into the center, is there anything that's going to take time to ramp us up to 100% capacity and use in the, the entire building itself? Um, do you foresee anything that's going to be two or three, four months down the road that we're not going to use now that would be used again next summer? Do you know what I mean? Do you kind of follow on the question? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To Councillor Elliott, <clears throat> we'll be up and running. Once we make the move, this has sort of been a year in the planning, so once we make the move, we'll be up and running very quickly once we're in. But to go back to Darlene's point in the report, is that full operation, full energy consumption will take the winter of 2017, 2018 to have that in the books to really see what those kind of peaks are. I wouldn't think the summer peaks with the garage doors open and uh, the free air conditioning and everything going on, that that won't be a component of it. It'll be more towards the winter season when the peaks are hit. Uh, so the full season, the full operation of one year, I think, is, is the key for it. But we'll be up and running right away. 
Any other questions on this issue? There being none, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Next one is item number eight, Mr. Main. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would like to read the, uh, the whole part of it here. Uh, Engineering and Operations Operation Division Report Number 2017-51, Subject, the Port Colburn Distribution System, Annual Inspection. That having again been awarded a rating and a ranking of 100% compliant by the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change for the City's Water System, Engineering and Operations, Operations Division Report 2017-51, Port Colburn Distribution Systems Annual Inspection Report be received for, for information, and I would like to congratulate all people involved in it. Thank you. Is there a <coughs> seconder for that recommendation? <coughs> Councillor Butters? All those in favor? Yes, sir. Opposed? Yes, sir. Carried. Good job, Darby. Oh. Great job. As a comment, uh, Mr. Mayor, who's coming? Comment, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and I hope this puts uh, the people who come door to door trying to sell you the filter and uh, trying to tell everybody in Port Coburn that the quality of water just isn't uh, up to par. Uh, I mean, these people uh, from the Ministry of the Environment, uh, they don't mess around, and I'm thinking that uh, tap water tastes pretty good to me. Thank you so much. Okay, that concludes this section of the agenda. We have now go back to the original agenda. Are there any notices of motion? There being none, Mr. Dash, I have a call for a motion of adjournment. Moved by Mr. Dash, seconded by Councilor Demery. All those in favor? <coughs> Carried. <coughs> there are no uh, in-camera items tonight. So we move on to the regular meeting of councils, 19-17, <coughs> on Monday, April 10th, following a committee of the whole meeting. The agenda, introduction, introduction of agenda items. Are there any, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, one this evening. I would like to note that the bylaw to authorize an agreement with Sir John Colburn Youth Soccer Club has been withdrawn due to the deferral of the agreement during the committee of the whole meeting. Thank you. And entertain a motion to confirm the agenda. Moved by Councillor Bodner, seconded by Councillor Doucette. All those in favor? Carried. Are there any disclosures of interest on this meeting? At this meeting? There being none, that shall be so noted. I entertain a motion to adopt the regular minutes of uh, Council 0817, held on March 27, 2017. Is there a mover for that motion? Councilor Dance, seconded by Councilor Kenny. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. There being none, I call for approval of those items not requiring separate discussion. Moved by Councillor Doucette, seconded by Councillor Bodner. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. There are no proclamations this evening. We have minutes of boards or trying. There are none, Madam Clerk. There are none. There are no minutes to approve. A consideration of bylaws, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, that the following bylaws be enacted and passed. Bylaw 6455-2217, being a bylaw to authorize entering into an agreement with Greenside Landscaping respecting refuse and debris removal and grass mowing. Bylaw 6456-2317, being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 11509781 respecting lands municipally known as 971. One Forks Road. 
bylaw 6457-2417 being a bylaw to designate a site plan control area and delegate council's powers under section 41 of the planning act establishing a site plan control procedure and the duties of the director of planning and development bylaw 4558 2517 being a bylaw to authorize entering into a management lease agreement renewal with the Port Colborne Minor Baseball Association. Bylaw 4559217 being a bylaw to authorize entering into a management lease agreement renewal with the Port Colborne Minor Girls Softball Association. Bylaw 6460 being a bylaw to amend bylaw. 43101462 being a bylaw prescribing on and off street parking for persons with disabilities. And finally, bylaw 64612817 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Colborne at its April 10th meeting of 2017. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'd entertain a motion to uh, confirm the pass those bylaws in bulk. Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Bodner. All those in favor? Gary, ladies and gentlemen, it would appear that we're now ready for a German. Go. Oh, motion. Motion, Frank. Is there a seconder? <laughs> Councillor Butters. Good night. Thank you for being here. And have a, have a happy Easter.